Our keynote speaker today is Mr. Montel Williams, an inspirational Emmy Award-winning television personality, actor, entrepreneur, and, direct and decorated naval officer. In addition to these credentials, and probably more important for today's events, he's a huge proponent of health and fitness. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Mr. Montel Williams. Thank you. It was almost 14 years ago this week that I laid in a gurney in Beth Israel North in New York City, and I watched that happen myself. I have a feeling I'm going to squeak too much if I hold this this way. You guys going to give me a hand on my thing? And why did that happen? Unbeknownst to me, I had a congenital birth defect that I had no knowledge of. And that con congenital birth defect caused one of the blood vessels in my sinus cavity right from my brain to swell about the size of my finger. Again, unbeknownst to me. So for about a month straight, April of 1988, I bled almost every single day. From a cup to a cup and a half of blood, I was in and out of the hospital, had nine cauterization procedures. Doctors went inside of me, put me out two times, trying to see if they could correct it. At one point in time, I was sent up to, I went to every hospital in this area, Johns Hopkins, the Wells Eye Clinic, you name it, I was taken to. They thought I had a brain tumor. They went up inside, took a look, and what they determined was because of this congenital birth defect, my brain, my, my heart was pumping way too much blood to the back of my sinus cavities and it was just weeping. So I ended up laying on a gurney one night because I bled so badly. They took me to the hospital, I went to Beth Israel North, and while laying in the hospital, they put a large balloon up uh, in here to see if they can tamponada off the blood. And on that gurney, I bled through that balloon. My heart stopped. It took doctors three attempts to bring me back. We had this, I hid it from the press. No one knew about it. When I woke up from a 17-hour operation the next day, and, and Dr. Woodson would know because they went up through all the way into the brain, came around, they sprayed in little particles up there to block this blood vessel off. I woke up 17 hours later, and I'm going to tell you, I said, I got down on my knees and said, God, I don't know what I've done, but I will do whatever it takes now to respect this gift you gave me. So I start marching off smartly, thinking Montel's got to do the right thing. I corrected my diet a little bit, a little bit. That meant, I, I ate, that meant I ate fast food four days a week instead of five. <laughs> you know, I was eating meat, you know, every meal, you know, bacon, sausage, that, ah, 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 every day. I'm working out, though, just like Admiral Honachek talked about the uh, powerlifting contest. Back then, I weighed about 225. I thought that it was, um, you, know, you weren't a man unless you took up more space. <laughs> so, and you weren't a man unless you could lift. You know, back then, we were talking about this powerlifting contest. I think back on it now how stupid I was. There was a point in time where I used to squat 603, right? Pretty impressive, right? 603 pounds? Guess what? Now I'm 5'11 and a quarter because I lost an inch of height <laughs> from putting all that stupid weight on my back. But I worked out, I exercised, I ate, I thought I was doing well. Then all of a sudden, I get this big breakthrough. Well, I tell you, it was crazy. This is in 1999. I'm, I, I get this phone call, they say, Montel, we want you to do a special episode of Touched by an Angel. We want you to be a guest star. So of course, I'm already I'm pumping up, getting all ready, because they wanted me to play this cult leader, one of the worst characters that show had ever had. Remember the show, Touched by an Angel? <laughs> Remember what I'm talking about, right? Okay. And in that show, I played this cult leader. It was like Jimmy Jones. And in this one scene in the movie of, of the show, I'm supposed to be standing in the church, and I got all the parishioners in there, and I've locked up all the doors, and I'm going to set the whole place on fire. And in the middle of that scene, I was supposed to break down and start crying. Now, all week before this, I couldn't figure out how to get myself to do that on cue, right? <laughs> I'm on the airplane flying from JFK to Utah where they shot the show, and my feet went on fire. Now, I'm not talking literally, but I'm talking figuratively, even literally, because I started experiencing neuropathic pain that was beyond anything I'd ever experienced in my life. 
They went on fire that day. I got out to Utah. I literally couldn't stop crying. My feet hurt so bad. My left arm started getting weak. I couldn't figure out what was going on. I checked into the motion picture set, checked in with the wardrobe. I went immediately to a friend of mine who lived in Utah as a doctor. He sent me to a neurologist. I go to a neurologist. The neurologist didn't even tell me at first. He went out of the office, called my friend, and said, I think Montel has a mess. Then he walked back in the room to me, looked me in the face, and said, well, I think you have a mess. And you know what? You're going to have to kind of knock off all the stuff. You're doing that television show of yours. You're going to have to slow this down. This guy just starts telling me, I have MS, give up on life, and go home and die. And I thought to myself, wait a minute. I, I've already been there, done that once. You know what I mean? <laughs> that was like a year ago. I don't want to go there again. And how dare you look me in the face and tell me you know who I am going to be with the illness that I have. You didn't know me when I walked in the door. How can you project ahead with some crystal ball and tell me how I'm going to be. This doctor told me I would be in a wheelchair in four to five years. African-American men do worse with this illness than anybody in the category. We are more prone to die faster. A 13% increase, decrease in life expectancy because I'm an African-American male with MS. Well, what does that mean? 13% decrease in, in life expectancy. Well, right now they say black men only live to 71 if we're lucky, so 70 is the right thing. 13%, that would be like eight years. That means I die at 63. I'm 57 right now. I'm dying in six years? <laughs> he don't know me. That was the first thought that I had. And then I set about that day making sure that I would change my life for the rest of my life because I said that day, I have MS, but MS is never going to have me. And so I set about trying to study and learn as much as I could about this illness, number one. Number two, the things that I could do to impact it. And then when I started to find out, I started realizing that it would not just impact MS, but it would impact the health and well-being of all people if I just shared what I learned. So one of the things I did immediately after being diagnosed, I dropped 22 pounds in four months. And this wasn't 22 pounds of fat. I dropped 22 pounds of muscle weight because the doctor looked at me and said, the strain that you're putting on your nervous system by picking up three and 400 pounds every couple of days is going to exacerbate and could cause different exacerbations. You need to back off that. So I need to figure out a different way to exercise. And I did that. Then I also realized that my biggest nemesis in life is inflammation. How can I impact inflammation? Well, exercise is one way, but another way is changing my diet trying to restrict those things that cause inflammation. When you start looking at the things that don't, you listen to the things that have been printed by the National Institute of Health, and every university around the country who's talking about healthy lifestyle, God and nature gave us what we need in plant form, in the grocery store, sitting there on the shelf to help you combat inflammation. It's called fruits and vegetables. So the second I realized that the more fruits and vegetables I put in my body, the more I can reduce the inflammation in my body, the more I can reduce the opportunity of me turning and having an episode because of my MS, I went hyperdrive and started eating fruits and vegetables. Now, I gotta say thank you so much to Admiral Harnacek and uh, Secretary Miller and Dr. Woodson for being here and helping you kick off an initiative today that I don't really even think you guys understand what you're getting involved with by kicking this off. How many of you know right now how much money we've spent on the wars in Iran, I mean Iraq and Afghanistan in the last 12 years? Anybody know? I think the running count right now is about $1.8 trillion. Amazing, right? Absolutely crazy. Do you know that in 2007, chronic illness cost this country $2.2 trillion. At that time, it was 16% of our GDP. Right now, it is projected to become over 20% of our GDP, not in 2050, by 2020. Right now, in this country, 75% of people who die, die because of symptoms related to a chronic illness. And right now, we have chronic illness, which is a at least impactable illness, you can impact yourself, is the leading cause of death in America. Secretary Miller talks about cigarettes, tobacco use. Let's talk about this year, 
There are stats that can prove this. This year, for the first time in the history of mankind, more people will die from the symptoms related to overeating than will die from starvation. Now, we can wait around and wait around and wait around and wait around, or we can get busy today. Let me tell you what, what, what I mean by getting busy today. I marched along smartly with my illness from 2000 until 2006, thinking I was doing the right things. I stayed on top of my medication. I take it, took it religiously. Let me ask this question before I even go any further. How many people, and I want you to be honest when I ask this question, how many of you right now have a prescription medication in your medicine cabinet at home that was given to you, let's say, a year ago or a year before that, that you never finished? How many of you? Raise your hand. Now, you know you're lying. <laughs> if I walk in your house right now and open up your medicine cabinet, you know you did not finish the prescription the doctor gave to you. And that's half our problem. Doctors prescribe you medication because they know that amount is what will heal your illness. We are not compliant. So that's just one thing. But let me tell you something. I've been super compliant. I take a shot every day. I take two needles every day. I take one in particular for my MS every single day. For the last 13 years, I've talked to Teva, the people who make the drug. I'm one of the only people in the entire world who they know has only missed 12 shots in 14 years. I take them within an hour of itself every day, no matter where I am in the world. Now, I thought I was doing the right thing. Taking my medication, doing a little exercise, eating okay. Eh, I'm doing okay. 2006, my disease took a turn. I hid that from the public. I hid it from my family. Because I didn't want people to notice how much pain I was in. I didn't want them to see how difficult it was for me to get around. And I was on a pretty steady slide, which was typical for this illness, and especially in African American males. Now, what's crazy, I'm going to talk about it in a minute, a little bit later, but I, also, I, I was very blessed to get involved in a double-blind study of a program about three years ago that has changed my life along with me actually dedicating myself to locking in things like. My diet has completely changed. We talk about the fact that we don't want you to eat fast food every day of the week or cut it back one day. Let me just tell you something. I would soft pedal this to you and act like you can take your time to get healthy, but I'm going to tell you, you don't have time. We don't have time. This nation doesn't have time. This is an initiative that was started here at DLA, but you should consider yourselves the people that are on those posters. Remember in World War II, where there was a poster, a guy had a red hat, and he was going, America needs you? Well, I'm going to check just put something in motion so that you can point to the rest of America and say, we need you. A war is about to begin, folks. If by 2020, health care is 20% of our GDP, this country can't stand. And then not, there's no number of rules, regulations. Mayors can't ban big sodas. It's not going to make a difference. <laughs> What's going to make a difference is us individually understanding our responsibility for our health care footprint. Let me explain something to you what I mean that, by that. In 2007, I realized I was getting ready to become a burden on this society, my family, myself. Honestly, I didn't want to live like that. So I started doing everything I could do. I started researching, studying. I started changing the way I exercise. I started changing the way I eat. Right now, I eat differently than anybody on this planet. I am eating raw 75 to 80% of everything I put in my mouth. The other 20% is one cooked meal a day, and that is normally with nothing processed. Now, kind of in a country like this, you can't go to a health food store and find something that's not processed. <laughs> However, I become what I call a label sleuth. So I look at the labels of everything that goes in my body. If I don't know what it is, why would you eat it? <laughs> and half of you go in, I will guarantee if I look in your cabinets, in your kitchens, in your house right now, your pantry is filled with box things that have more preservatives in it, more glue, more junk, than, and you wonder why you can't lose weight. This initiative is probably one of the most powerful initiatives I believe that the military has ever put in place. I'm going to tell you right now. Not just because it's a military-sponsored initiative, 
but it's one that's, that's going to include civilians. Let me show you something real quick. I think Secretary Miller said taking that walk in the afternoon can change the way you feel. Everybody in the room, stand up for a second, please. Stand up. Put down your papers on your chairs. You'll be able to do this. It's military. <laughs> Watch this. Well, I love this. Getting in the military room, I get to say stuff like this. Watch this. Everybody in the room. Right face. Whew. For you civilians, turn to the right. Oh, my goodness. Look at that. Now, watch this. Listening to every, this direction very carefully. Without hurting anyone, I want everybody to take their hands, look at me, put them right here in front of you, like this, like this. Right here. Shake them. Shake them hard. Harder. 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 Now, place them on the shoulder of the person in front of you. And without hurting anybody, shake them up lightly and wake them up. Shake them. <laughs> Stop. Turn to the left. Uh. Turn around to the left. I said, follow the directions. Put your hands right here in front of you. In front of you. Shake them hard. Shake them. Shake them. Shake them. Shake them. Shake them. Shake them hard. Put them on the shoulder of the person in front of you. Wake them up. Stop. Turn and face forward. Face them forward. Take your hands. Put them on your own shoulders like this. Shake them a little bit. Put them out in front of you. Shake them a little bit. Shake them. Shake them. Shake them. Shake them. Shake them. Shake them. Now sit down. Now watch this. Not just because it was funny, but right now you're breathing a little bit faster. Correct? Tell me if you don't feel just a little bit better. You were getting ready to go to sleep. <laughs> so what did I do? In 12 seconds, I just showed you the value of pumping up your heart. Just a little bit. You can do this at your desk. You don't have to get up and walk outside. Stand up at your desk. Grab that phone and while you're talking on the phone, stand there and do 30 squats. <laughs> Wait a second. You're laughing. I'm being, I'm being serious. I turned 57 years old this year. I'm the exact same size I am when I graduated from the United States Naval Academy. I weigh 180 pounds. I have a 30-inch waist for a 57-year-old man, and I'll tell you, it's six-pack hard. <laughs> but why? But believe me, I could care less about the outward appearance. What makes a difference for me is that this morning, let me just tell you what my schedule was like today. First of all, I flew in late last night. I got up this morning at 5 o'clock. I was in the gym. Don't tell me you have no time. If you, if you have to be here in the morning, you don't have a gym to go to, do not tell me you can't go in your kitchen, stand by your kitchen counter, which is the exact right height, and do squats and stop laughing. This is how you can change your life. Folks, I'm to, my choice is, if I don't, I can't walk. I couldn't walk before you right now. If I didn't hit the elliptical this morning and the treadmill, today, and I'm gonna do it tonight, to this afternoon, I'm gonna get on a plane when I leave here, I'm flying to all the way to San Francisco. Why? Because when I get to San Francisco, I met, I don't know if you guys know this about me, but for the last two and a half years, I go to Walter Reed or Bethesda, I visit our soldiers every single month. Not every third month, every month. I sit bedside with these guys. I've got a relationship with some of these guys now after three years. I've seen them when they came in before they mother, their mother saw them. I saw them after their first operation. I see them when they get fitted for their prosthetic. I see them when they make their first run. I see them when they actually get ready to walk out the door and come back and get it repaired. So in the last two years, I've had a relationship with a young Lear. I've had a relationship with a young man who is Staff Sergeant Cedric King. Staff Sergeant Cedric King, last July, he's a, bronze, a Medal of Honor a recipient, a Bronze Star recipient. Last July, he was in Afghanistan, and of course, like the rest of our guys, an IED almost split him in half. I saw this young man. Oh. Like so many of them that I see, I saw him the second week he was there. His mom was just flying up that day. He was waiting at the front door to see his mother come in. He had hoses coming out of him. He's double amputee. He sat there for 10 minutes motivating me to continue to come back. Sam Montel, you don't know how much these guys appreciate it. Please come back. Please come back. So I told Cedric, you know what? We'll stay in touch. So tonight I'm taking Cedric because he finally has been fitted out correctly. He got his last repair of damage. 
he's going with me to Mammoth, and I'm going to teach him how to, how to hellebore or how to ski. And then once he learns how to ski this summer, we're taking him down to Chile to participate in a documentary about soldiers who just don't want to give up. Now, right. But the only reason why I bring up Cedric is because he could have quit. He could use this as an excuse. He could say, I'm injured, I'm hurting, I'm going to stop. I see that man, I feel like, what a loser I am. Every time I go talk to him. Because he motivates me to get it further. I'm also, don't worry, just go help another guy, just talk to somebody else. And I'm doing it. That kid's driving me all over the world right this minute. <laughs> okay? But why? Because he understands that if he doesn't, he can impact the way he feels. So he's not giving up. I look in this room. Everyone in this room is, yeah, I'll say, I'm looking in this room. If you are just like the rest of the country, 60% of you have a chronic illness right now. And about 30% of you have two. Okay? And in less than four years, the same room, 70% of you will have two. And this man has no legs, half a hand, and he gets his butt up every day, goes to the gym. He pays attention to what he eats every day because he knows how it's going to make him feel tomorrow. What's your excuse? See, the ammo, they have to soft pedal, not soft, they have to be nice. They have to tell you guys we're going to work at this half step. You know, we're going to step our way along the way. You know what I mean? They got to they they put it to you that way. I'm going to tell you, it is the difference between the way I feel today and the way I'm not going to feel tomorrow if I don't do the regimen that I'm on. I'm extreme. I have MS. I have an a, a enemy battling my immune system every day, trying its best to bring me down. It causes, you look at every, the PDR, just the medication I take, it causes what they claim is depression. And that's the other thing I've got to talk about. As you pay attention to your physical health, you are the ones who support all of us who are in so much pain, you don't pay attention to your own pain, your emotional health, which I'm gonna tell you, won't, you won't get anywhere with your physical health until you start paying a little bit of attention to this. And it's much more simple than you think. It's so much easier than you think. It's not walking outside for 25 minutes. It's sitting at your desk and doing something really simple. Watch this. Everybody, sit up nice and straight. Straight as you can be. Straight. You're in elementary school right now. Sit up straight. <laughs> Here comes Sister Montel with a ruler. Sit up straight, all right? All right, sit up straight. Now, sitting up straight, I'm going to, everybody, hands on your lap. I want you all at the exact same time. I'll count to three. One, two, three. Take a deep breath in. Hold it. Let it out. Take a deep breath in. Hold it. Let it out. Now, I'm going to tell you a little something I want you to try to do. This time, I want everybody in the room to close your eyes. Close them. I see you peeking. Close them. <laughs> now, we're going to do that same thought process of taking those three breaths, two breaths. But I'm going to take three this time, but you're going to do it slower, and I want everybody in the room to do me a favor. I want you to act like for a second nobody else is here. Close your eyes. No one else is here. And I want you to think about the most beautiful thought in your life. For me, the most beautiful thought in my life is my children being born. Another one of those most beautiful thoughts in my life is the day I walked across the stage at the Naval Academy and I watched those hats go up in the air. Another one of those most beautiful days of my life was the day I received my first MSM. Blew me out the door. Destroyed me. Okay, you ready? I want you to pick that thought and I'm going to have you think about this right now. I'm going to count to three and take a deep breath. Count to three, take it. One, two, three, in. Out. Do it again. Keep on that thought. One, two, three, in. Out. And on this one now, I want you in your mind to think of that thought. Give it a kiss when you let out your breath. On the count of three. One, two, three. Suck it in. Hold it. Give that gift to yourself a kiss. Let it out. Open your eyes. Look at me for a second. You can take three minutes at your desk and make yourself feel this good every day. You can make yourself feel this good all day. You talk about depression, let me just tell you this. I was diagnosed 
by some of the top doctors in this country is having clinical depression. Chemical depression. My tell you're depressed. They told me I was depressed so much, I started walking around trying to live up to their expectations and be depressed. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm depressed. Oh, my God, I'm depressed. <laughs> Fact. National Institute of Health has said this year, fruits, vegetables, and exercise can impact your psychological health as much as any psychotropic drug you, you can take. They've done it in multiple double-blind studies. You can change the way you feel emotionally, physically, just by applying some very, very small techniques to the brain. Let me give you another one. I'm going to give you this one, and I'm, I'm going to let you go because I know you've got to go, but I'm going to give you this one. Really easy. I'm going to show you how powerful your brain is and how all of you who doubt that you'll be able to keep up with this program for more than a month, all of you who doubt that it's going to have any impact on you, all of you who doubt that your brain has the power to take charge of you as a person, let me show you right now. I'm going to show you how one thought can change your physicality immediately. Anybody doubt that I can do this? Oh, good. All right, good. Sit up nice straight again. Everybody take your hand right here. Hold it like this, like you're holding something between your fingers. Everyone, got it? Holding something between your fingers. Now, what you're holding in between your fingers, folks, is the most delicious piece of food you ever had in your life. I'm telling you, if the most delicious thing for you is a crab cake, that's what you got. If the most delicious thing to you is a strawberry dipped in chocolate, that's what you got. Look at it. Everybody, look at it. Don't look at me. Look at your piece of food right now. You know what I'm holding? Oh, I'm going to tell you what I'm holding. Right now, I'm holding it in my fingers. My father-in-law makes the best ribs in the world. Mm, got one right here. I'm looking at it, okay? Now, everybody, look at your rib. Don't look at me. Look at, your, look at your food. While you're looking at it, I want you to take it, and on the count of three, you're going to take a bite, okay? Ready? On the count of three. One, two, psych. Don't do it yet. <laughs> look at it again. Look at that piece of food. Visualize it. Ready? On the count of three, take a bite. One, two, three. Take a bite. How many people's mouths are salivating right now? <laughs> you just use the conscious thought to change your physicality. You can use a conscious thought and quiet thought to change how you feel if you think you're depressed. As easily as you can speak yourself down that spiral, you can talk yourself back out of it. Now, this initiative here, this well-based initiative, healthy-based initiative, I'm going to tell you, as I said earlier, I want you all to please try to take this in your heart as if you're the person in that poster. Not only does this work at DLA inside the walls, but when you go home, this should be working with your neighbor. Some of you are going to start to see immediate gains. You're going to start walking around this building. You're going to start skipping the elevator. You're going to start seeing gains. You're going to lose one, two pounds, a th maybe three pounds. Share it immediately with somebody. Walk in and be proud. Because that infection will, will cause other people to try to have the same gains. And the next thing you know, we will have a movement. Let me just tell you. I told you in 07, my disease took a turn. I was having such a hard time. Started working at it really hard. The last two and a half years, I've been involved in a very special project through the University of Wisconsin. That project, because of Secretary McHugh, is now getting ready to be, is being funded by the U.S. military because the device that I've used to help me manage my illness and bring me back, we're going to get FDA approval on within the next six to seven months and get this in the mouths of every soldier that has ever suffered a concussive brain injury, traumatic brain injury, or even suffers from PTSD. We have a definitive project right now underway that's being studied and researched every day. There are meetings being held on it every week, and we will have this in your mouths and in our soldiers' mouths within the next year. Because of that work that I did, instead of giving up, up until 2007, I was able to snowboard. I used to snowboard almost 100 days a year. I had to quit completely in 2007, and I didn't go back until this last year. But all the work that I put into this and the fact that I've been managing my diet, managing my exercise, managing my flexibility, this past summer, this is what I got a chance to do.
That was after five years off, not being able to touch a snowboard, not even thinking about I could ever do it again in life. I almost quit. But it was the fact that I paid attention to every little detail of my health and wellness that got this back. And now I'm going to stay on that board for as long as I can. One day, I may not be able to do this. MS is going to win a part of this battle. I can't stop it until they come up with a cure. But even if I'm in a wheelchair, guaranteed, I will roll in this room with spinners on that chair and tell you to behave. <laughs> I do want to say one last thing. Admiral, I stand here ready to serve. I know this initiative is going to take place in 13 bases. You need me to go out and talk about this. Do you need me to go and help move this forward? I stand ready to serve. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Please be seated. <laughs> Mr. Williams, thank you so much for sharing your personal story about implementing some of these healthy changes and how the impact, the tremendous impact uh, they've made in your life. And I know if we implement these changes uh, in our own lives that they can make a tremendous difference too. 